There you go. It's been very interesting what you've been saying up here this morning already. Um, you know, I've discovered lately, I was just thinking about life. I know you just think about life. And I thought my estimation was life's a bit like a battery. You know, there's negatives, but right alongside there's a positive. Yeah. They're both there. And the thing is, a battery works and produces and drives vehicles and goodness knows what, but there has to be some negatives involved, but it's the positives that we want to embrace. You know, the thing that has been on my heart, and, and actually this started about well, months ago now, I really wanted to read through Exodus again. I really had a real desire to read through Exodus, and uh, as well as the letters, the New Testament letters. And uh, as I began to read through this, something became quite clear to me was God's line of distinction. You know, Neil said earlier on the difference between religion and reality. There's a definite line, and, and God's got a line of distinction, an unmistakable presence that he wants to put around his people so that we are different. In Psalm 5, verse 12, I've always loved, loved Psalm 5, verse 12. It says, he wraps his favor around about us like a shield. You know, favor positions you in a better place than just normal. And then he says it's a shield around about you as well. So it keeps you in that place. So the provision of his favor, but then also the provision that he shelters us there. I don't know whether you've noticed, but uh, today there's a lot of control happening across the globe, a lot of negative control. And uh, I'm going to share some things about that. I'm not going to major on the negative, but the realities of it. Uh, you today, you know, we look at Hong Kong of recent times and riots because of the suppression of government that really isn't operating in the right manner. Uh, in Chile, in Bolivia, in Venezuela, there's unrest in all these places. There's chaos in Arab countries. It's amazing in Iraq, Iran, Syria, etc. And there's a rebellion rising up against that troll, that wrong manner of control over the lives of people. And uh, as I looked at that, I, I thought, you know, it's fascinating how many times this book says, remember, or you know this, but I'm going to remind you again. This is see over and over and over. And so you probably know this, but I'm going to remind you again this morning, because uh, that's all I've got, because that's what I feel God gave me. Control is an interesting thing, just a very simple illustration, control. If you, how many people drive a vehicle? Most of us drive a vehicle. You drive a vehicle, you drive it in the left-hand lane, you drive at 60 k's an hour in the 60 zone, uh, you stop at red lights, stop signs, give way, you check all those things out, you're totally in control. But if you drive that same vehicle at 150 k's an hour in the 70 zone, and you're on the wrong side of the road, you're controlling. Very different thing. And controlling creates an atmosphere of fear, intimidation, challenge all around about. But I'm going to read a couple of scriptures. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 5 to 11, I'm just going to quote these, okay? So it's 1 Thessalonians 5, 5 to 11. And Paul's writing, he says, You are the children of light, sons and daughters of the day, not created at night, not owned by darkness, let's stay awake and in control. Then he goes on and makes some simple statements, not drunk on alcohol, not endlessly sleeping. Now obviously he wasn't saying don't sleep. You know, one of the things that I pray with Hazel every night is God says he gives his beloved sleep. You'll both lay down in peace and sleep and you'll dwell safely because he makes you dwell safely. But he's saying endlessly sleeping or really not awake and aware of what's going on all around about us. That's what he's speaking about. Says, stay sober and in control, covered with a breastplate of faith and love and a helmet and the hope of salvation. You know, two of those things are hard things, hey? Faith and love, they're hard things. Then he says, the head thing is the helmet of salvation. Proverbs 4 says, guard your heart with all diligence. So there's an emphasis of the heart, God, talking about the hidden man of the heart, the spirit man, guarding that with all diligence and then guarding this up here because that's the filter that runs down to there. Right? And if we let the wrong stuff stay in there, it filters through and then we act in the wrong manner. 
So I'm going to go back to the Old Testament. God says, I want you to be in control. And one of my favorite scriptures, if you've been around me at all lately, and I've probably quoted part of it, is 2 Corinthians 2.14, which simply says, Thanks be unto God, who always leads us in triumph, and through us releases the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Other Bibles, my Bible simply says, through us releases the fragrance of his knowledge all over the world. So that's the thing. God never just leads us in triumph. What would be the point of that? You've got to be going somewhere. So he leads us in triumph so that through us there can be released the fragrance of his knowledge wherever we are. And uh, that's a precious thing. So I'm going to go back into Exodus, and I'm just going to recount some things that I felt God really laid on my heart, as I said, some months ago. I was reading through it, and, and it just fascinated me. I just want to quote this to you in 1 John 2, verse 18. John the Apostle's writing this, and uh, he's writing from Ephesus, which now is Western Turkey in that area. And uh, when John wrote this, he said, My children, this is the final hour. Uh, you remember how long ago John wrote that? That's, you know, a few weeks ago gone by. We had a few sleeps since then. But he says, my children, this is the final hour. You have heard that the Antichrist, the greatest enemy to his Jesus kingdom, is coming. In fact, many Antichrists are already here. This tells us how late it really is. Now, you can either take that as a negative statement or as a motivational statement to realize we're living in a day where there's a lot of stuff going down, pressure, on the kingdom of God, certainly, and he's called you and I, really, that we might be able to stand and contend with that which comes against the kingdom. We just simply put it in words, in Jesus' words, hey, we pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I mean, do you ever stop to think about that? I stopped probably 15 years ago. I was walking, talking to the Lord, and all of a sudden it really hit me what I was really saying. Your kingdom come your will be done down here just like it's being done up there. That really blew me away. That added a whole difference to praying, that whole thing. Very easy to pray the words. So Exodus 4, God calls Moses, and uh, Exodus 3 starts off there, and Moses has a bit of an argument with God. You ever had one of those? You know, he said, no, I can't do this. Who am I? I, don't really, I can't talk very good. All the things that you and I have said, no, I can't. He can, I can see him. I could recommend this one to you, God, but uh, I'm, I'm not doing real good in this area. And anyway, none of that worked, thankfully. And when God called him, he gave three important signs to Moses, which really grabbed me when I started to look at them. The first one was the snake. You remember he had a staff, and God said, throw that down on the ground, and became a snake. And if you remember, the first thing that happened was, Moses ran from it. But then God said, pick that thing up by the hand, and it was running from him. Good thing to remember with a snake, hey? You can either run from him, be dictated to by him, or say, Moses took that thing up in his hand, and God was saying, you can handle this. You and I can handle it. We can handle what the enemy's about if we're plugged into him. We're the children of light, children of the day. Second thing was disease. God said to Moses, stick your hand in your robe, pull it out, it was white, leprous. God said, put it back in again, pull it out, it was totally whole. Interesting, the snake, the disease, and the third sign was the blood. Very interesting, significant factors, the blood. The very next thing, now the blood never happened. He saw the snake, and he saw the leprosy, the disease, but the blood happened a little bit later with the Nile River, and it says when that blood came, it covered all the land. I believe that was a precursor, really, to what was going to happen through Jesus. A recognition when they slew the lamb, they put the blood over the doorposts, and when they went out under this exodus journey, they went out under the blood. And thank God we're still under the blood. Better blood than that one. The blood of Jesus that we've just celebrated in communion. So those three things, and the thing as I looked at this, I thought, you know, 
you might have said to God, saying, God, God, you're telling me what to do all the time. I've got to do what you do. God wasn't controlling Moses here. He was calling him like he calls you and I. But the interesting thing is, as Moses responded to the call, then he was in control. No different to your life, my life. We respond to the call that God has, then we're in control because we're about our father's business. That Jesus simply said when he was about 12 years of age. So these three things. When signs start, and I'm not going to go through all the signs, but when all the signs started to happen, the Egyptians in, uh, the magicians in, in Egypt were able to emulate those same things. Very interesting, really, that realm, that spiritual realm, until they got to the gnats. And when they got to the gnats, they couldn't do it anymore. And even the guys that were in the spiritual realm, the wrong realm, recognized there was a difference between the ability they had in the spirit realm and the ability that God's man had in the spirit realm. There was a line of distinction very clearly, and they recognized that, and they spoke that out. So this distinction that's there, and the thing is, there's always a limit to counterfeit. The enemy might counterfeit some stuff and do, but there's always a limit. There's always a, a barrier. There's always a time where he runs out of the wherewithal. So in Exodus 8, then, God makes a significant statement, which I've probably made three times already, but God says this, I'll make a distinction between my people and your people. Egyptians, for us, representing the world system, I'll make a distinction between my people and your people. Now, the issue is Pharaoh, and Pharaoh was his own god. He was recognized as a god in his nation. He was his own god, and he was the epitome of control. I mean, you read the story. If you read it, you would have, I'm sure. But if you read back over, he was the epitome of control. And one factor in control underlying is always pride. There's always a pride issue, the underlying motivator in a controlling spirit. So this exodus of God's people out of Egypt is a graphic picture of the enemy controlling, but also God demonstrating he's the ultimate authority in every situation. That's why I love it. Because for me, I, I live by pictures. Uh, in the building trade, it was someone could have rattled off all, oh, you do this, 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 and this, but if they said, drew it in the sin, this is how you do it, I was good. So you might live by words, you might be able to just, but I think a lot of us live by pictures. And we get a picture of something, then we can reproduce it, do it, we know where to go. So God gives us pictures, and God's really giving some pictures here in this whole situation in Exodus. And there's some outcomes here. I wanted to share some outcomes of the enemy exercising his control. It's in Exodus 10. Now, I'm not reading a lot of scripture, but it's in the book. Uh, check me out later. He says, the thing that I'm going to do, there's going to be a locust plague. And again, what impresses me, God says what the consequences will be of negative responses. He doesn't keep anyone in the dark. So he said, there's going to be a locust plague. And this is what God said. They're going to blanket the ground. They're going to devour every crop. They're going to strip every tree. They're going to fill your houses. No one has ever seen anything like this before. There's some similarities in that to the day we're living in. A lot of things, actually, that in certainly my lifetime we haven't seen before that have changed in an amazing way, a negative way. So there's evidence of this controlling atmosphere going on that thankfully we don't have to live under, but we're there and we recognize it's there and we're called really to do something about it. So this controlling factor there comes in and uh, God wants to demonstrate again that he's the ultimate authority. Then the next thing that happens, it does happen exactly like that. Exactly. Everything gets wiped out. I mean, you imagine, you know, your house being full of locusts without everything else outside. Can you imagine that in your house? I know where my wife would be. She wouldn't be in the house, that's for sure. She'd be gone over the hill and far away. But everywhere these things and the thing is as I looked at this I thought the wrong control starves a life source in people the wrong sort of controlling influence 
It starves the life source and the life force that happens in the lives of people. God said right back about his people. He heard them, he saw them, saw the bondage they were in, and they saw that the Egyptians really had them working in hard bondage. That's what the world system wants to do today. It wants us to be in hard bondage. That's not God's plan by a long way. But stuff happens around about us, the negative pole, the positive pole, really, which one do we choose to go to? So in Exodus 10 verse 7, then Pharaoh said to him, people aren't dumb. People that are a little bit alive and alert and looking around, they know what's going on. And so his own servants, which they stuck their neck out, said to Pharaoh, look around you, don't you see that Egypt's in ruins? You know, I've said that inadvertently, not to their faces, but about some of the politicians that we have. Have a look around about you. Maybe you see what you're doing. But I've read in this book that God says, pray for them. He didn't say, put them down. Pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for them. Believe something's going to change in where they're heading and where they're thinking. So, <clears throat> so this whole deal's going on, and then Pharaoh sends for Moses and Aaron again, and you read the story, it happens again and again, sends for them again, and, he's, and he says, listen, I'm going to be really condescending. He didn't use those words, but condescension is a very interesting thing in life, isn't it? This is a condescending uh, thing that, that Pharaoh responds to this request quest to let God's people go. He said, some of your people may go and serve this God of yours, but not all. You know, a controlling thing will always open up a little bit and be consenting to, I'll give a little, I'll just open up a little bit, a little bit, but I'm still going to remain in control. The evidence is still there. Ecclesiastes 3, probably you all know that, might have read it for a while. They're the clean pages in the book I've discovered in a lot of books. Uh, it says, for everything there's a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. And one of the things that goes on and says is there's a time to speak and a time to be silent. And Moses knew this was a time to speak. And I think really we're walking into that time more and more where it's a time to speak. Really to not speak wrongly, reactively, but to speak with some godly wisdom into the circumstances that are going on. So it was a time to speak. And uh, he said Moses' response to Pharaoh's request or condescending, condescending request was, um, no, all of us must go. The young and old will take our sons, our daughters, our flocks and our herds. You can put in there your caravan, your boat, your semi-trailer, really your jet ski, whatever else. We're all going to celebrate a great festival to the eternal. The thing is, really, the picture was, hey, Moses was saying, hey, no, God's provision encompasses all. Salvation is for all. It's not a limited deal. It's for everybody out there, and we're the carriers of it to really share it around. So then there's a reaction of control, which always produces threats. Very interesting fact that to me that I, I read this in the book, and I think, well, it's all there in the book. And this is what then Pharaoh responds with. The eternal had better be with you. If you really think I'm going to let you take your little ones with you, it better be with you. And otherwise, I'll be jumping on you like a ton of bricks. Control speaks in that manner. He says you can only take the men and go serve. I mean, that's a great start, hey? You can take all the men and go and serve the eternal. Well, what was that going to produce in the end result? Think about it for a minute, anyway. So you take the men, but no, not all of you can go. That's not going to happen. Um, a good start, but not going to happen. And with control, it always goes too far and reaps the consequences. You think about that. And of course, with this locust situation, they did come and uh, they devoured everything, every green leaf, not nothing was left. Total picture of devastation and simply just born out of a stubborn, controlling, rebellious spirit, really, that all this stuff became so devastating. So the next scenario that I'm sort of just touching on anyway is an evidence of remorse but not repentance. 
And it's interesting in life, isn't it, where you can see remorse, but it's not repentance. There are always words in remorse. And this is really what, they sound great. This is what Pharaoh said. I've sinned against the eternal, your God, and against you. Now, please forgive me just this once. Um, what about all the stuff that happened before back there? Just forgive me just this one. And pray to the eternal, your God, and ask him to take away this plague of death from me. Pharaoh is still his own God. It's all about me. Take this away from me. Don't worry about the people. Don't worry about everything that's happened to them. Just take it away from me. So there's no repentance in that, no turnaround whatsoever. That's the situation, but I mean, I'm speaking about, my emphasis is God's line of distinction, this unmistakable line around about us, not religious, but really we're plugged in to his truth. So Moses again, blessing, cries out to God, and God causes a strong west wind to blow, and all the locusts are blown out to sea. Everything's done with their... Wonderful. Then the next sign's a very interesting one. It says a deep darkness over Egypt, three days of intense darkness so that they couldn't even see each other. I'm fascinated by that. You know, back at that time, here's this incredible darkness. What was that all about? What, why would God cover with darkness? Because I think he was pointing the way, and Matthew 27 spoke about it, where when Jesus hung on that cross, it wasn't three days, but it was three hours darkness covered. And Father, God himself covered the light of the world over with darkness because he was carrying the sin of the world for you and I. That darkness was there for three hours. And that must have been amazing to them, but three days living in darkness. Thank God we don't live in darkness. We are the children of light. So the miracle of Egypt was this at this time. People couldn't see one another, but where God's people were living, they had light. I mean, how fascinating is God? He can separate light from darkness, just like that. Dark all where the enemy was, light where his people were. Man, I think that's brilliant. And that's where Paul got that from, really, when he wrote about you are the children of light. Comes back from what he brought from the old rights back into the new. So, now Pharaoh says, okay, okay, enough's enough. You can go and serve your God. Everyone, even your little ones, but not your herds and your flocks. And incredible. Isn't control is an incredible thing. It's all, I'm always just going to hang on to that bit. I'm not going to open up. I'm just going to hang on to that bit so you know that I still have got the control in this whole deal. So ungodly control does seek to manipulate the outcomes of God's purpose. And David declared in Psalm 23, which we probably all know and we've sung, the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want or lack. He said God doesn't cause what he's provided in abundance to lack. It's always there. He's always got the good stuff that we can enter into. Pharaoh's then outburst of ultimate control comes out of his mouth. If you ever try to see my faith again, I'll have you killed. You know, a controlling spirit deals in deathly principles and becomes personal. Gets down to those sorts of issues. You ever try to see my face again, I'll have you killed. I'll get rid of you. Get rid of you right out of the way. And Moses' response, literally, these aren't the words totally written in the book, but they're the essence of what he was saying. He said, Pharaoh, you've prophesied your own demise. You'll never see my face again. And that's what happened. That was the end result. You know the story of the Red Sea and so forth and what took place. But the ultimate thing in control that saddens me is it always affects family and its function. Where Exodus 11, where God speaks then through Moses to Pharaoh and he says at midnight, I'm going to move through Egypt. Every firstborn son and every family will die. Firstborn of all your cattle, livestock will die as well. So it was a devastating picture, well and truly. God, God doesn't hate Egyptians, so I need to throw that in. You know, Mary and Joseph took Jesus down into Egypt to escape Herod, who was another great controlling influence. So it's not, he's not against Egypt. I'm not talking down against Egypt. I'm just saying representation of a world system, the wrong 
spirit controlling antichrist type influences that come in and try to control what God wants to do. So there's going to be a loud wailing throughout Egypt, a deep and dismal mourning unlike anything before. But the line of distinction, God's line of distinction, God said this, but among the people of Israel, not even a dog's bark will disturb the night. Among my people, even if a dog barks, it's not going to disturb the night. And Isaiah wrote something in Isaiah 26 verse 3 where he said, He will keep him or her in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. That's the precious thing about the line of distinction that God's made for his people. Hey? We've got a place to dwell. <coughs> so we get to this end of this story basically where Moses says to Pharaoh, then you'll know, Pharaoh, the Eternal makes a sharp distinction between Egypt and between Israel. God's statement, my people, those who, and those who refute my truth, there's a definite line of distinction. And again, I'm just going to quote 2 Corinthians 2.14, then I'm going to read you a story, and then I'm finished. Stories, I don't know about you, but stories that are true stories grab my heart particularly when you've been already reading something in the Word of God and you read a story and you see the evidence, you see the picture, like talking about Reinhard Bonnke. I mean, what an amazing man. The millions, say, that have come to Christ. I remember some years ago where his son-in-law said to him, oh, Reinhard, you're getting a bit old now. Maybe you need to sort of slow down a bit and hand over to me. Reinhard's answer was, you ever been down to the airport, son? Of course, he'd been to about the time. You ever notice those big 747s? The closer they get to the, un the end of the runway, the hot faster they're going. I mean, that would have to come out of born something inside, hey? You don't just throw that away off the top of your head. Anyway, so this is, I'm thankful to God who always makes us or marches us in victory under the banner of the anointed one, Jesus. And through us, he spreads the beautiful fragrance of his knowledge to every corner of the earth. The story I'm going to show you is a true story. It's about a guy called Dmitry in 20th century Russia, where there are about eight decades that Russian Christians were persecuted under communist government. Kindergartens would hold, uh, kindergarten teachers would hold the Bible up to these little children and say, have you seen anything like this in your place? And if they said yes, then the government official would visit their home and there'd be all sorts of strife that would happen there. Pastors and people were in prison, many never heard from again. Pastors had to present uh, at government offices, report on any new people that they encountered, and uh, put in submit their sermon topics for approval. About that. This guy, Dmitri, was a follower of Jesus and his family, and they lived in a small village four hours from Moscow. The nearest church was a three-day walk, so they only got there about twice a year. But Dmitri began teaching his family circle Bible stories and verses, and the neighbors heard about what was happening in his home, and so they wanted to be involved. When 25 people were coming, the government officials checked and demanded that he stop. Dmitri refused. Soon 50 people were coming. Dmitri was dismissed from his factory job, his wife was fired from her teaching position, and his sons were expelled from the school. Still he continued. Soon 75 people were coming. House was too small. People were standing outside at the window so they could hear him sharing what he was sharing, listening to this whole thing. Villagers crammed into every available space. One night a group of soldiers burst in, slapped Dimitri around, and threatened him to stop or worse was to come. As the, I like this bit. As the officer was leaving, a little grandmother stepped in front of him and with a finger pointing said, you've laid hands on a man of God, you will not survive. Two days later, he died of a heart attack. God, when God intends to do something, I, and that, uh, no one's going to stop him. So that news brought 150 people now that we're gathering at the house. 
Dimitri was arrested and sentenced to 17 years in prison. His cell was so small, one step from there was that wall, one step from there was that wall, one step from there was that wall, one step there was that wall. Very, very small, cramped conditions, obviously. So he was the only believer in amongst 1,500 criminals, prisoners in this particular prison. At daybreak, Dimitri stood, raised his arms and sang a song of praise. Prisoners jeered, but he still sang. Any scrap of paper he found, he'd write Bible verses, verses on it, and when it was full, because it was a damp wall, then he'd stick it on the damp wall inside his prison. The uh, guards would see it and they'd come and pull them down, but still he'd write more and he'd stick them back up on the damp, damp wall. They'd beat him, but still he worshipped. 17 years. On one occasion, he almost denied his faith in Jesus. The guards convinced him that his wife was murdered and his children were wards of the state. Dimitri broke. He agreed to renounce his faith. So the, the guards arranged that they'd come back the next morning with a document. He'd sign that document. He'd be free immediately. He'd be let go immediately from the prison. But what they didn't know was that there were believers that were praying. And when believers pray, things happen. Praise God for that. So as they were praying for him, a thousand kilometers away, his family sensed a special burden to pray for him. And as they prayed, God supernaturally allowed Dimitri to hear their voices and he knew they were safe, a thousand kilometers away. The guards came the next morning, had the document to be signed, but they encountered a new man, calm, resolute, not signing any papers, said, God, let me hear the voices of my wife, children, and my brother praying for me. You lied to me. They're safe and following Jesus. I'm not signing anything. They beat him and threatened to execute him, but Dimitri's resolve only increased. He still worshipped each morning, stuck people with scriptures on his cell walls. Finally, the officials had enough. They dragged him from his cell down the corridor through the center of the prison towards the place of execution as they did, 1,500 criminals raised their hands and voices and sang the song of praise that Dimitri had sung each morning. It's not long after that, after they said to him, Who are you? He said, I'm the son of the living God. Not long after that, they released him and went home to his wife and to his family. He was in control. And we would say, Gee, was God leading him in triumph in 17 years in that situation? I haven't led 1,500 people to Christ, I don't think. The one man who persisted and sang and worshipped God. You know, we're singing that old song this morning, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. First thing ran through my mind was when uh, the prophetic uh, the guy from the States. No, not Greg back some time ago, 2016, when he said he was activating the heart of David in, in this church, in this people. I'm activating the heart of David. And the heart of David was a worshipful heart, eh? rising up to God. So God's line of distinction is that evidence, thanks be unto God, who always causes us to triumph and through us dispenses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. You know, I don't know this morning, I guess as I, I finish, I think about what I believe God put on my heart. And maybe you've experienced control, that sort of intimidation and over your life, where really that's caused you real pain and heartache. You know, you, you've got to come out from under that. You stay there, man, you just squash. That life sources in you just get squeezed more and more. Or on the other hand, maybe you've operated in control, in the wrong manner of control. That one's not remorse, that one's repentance. Submitting it unto God and allowing God to work in and change your life. So this morning as we stand together, can we stand together? I mean, nearly like you come. And if there's anyone this morning that you, you know, those two circumstances, there might be other things, but... You know, I guess that's what really has been on my heart. It's been under control to break free from being under that kind of intimidation.
might have been way back. But if you're a controller, then that too needs to come and be submitted unto God. So I'd just love to be able to stand with you and believe with you and uh, look to God with you. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, David. Amen. <coughs> I was a controller once. Drove my wife crazy. Put her into a hospital. Put her into a place where I never thought I'd see her again. The doctor told me I'd never see her again. I was self-centered, full of control. That was just because of circumstances, situation around my life. The doctor said, if you can keep, if you keep treating your wife the way you are, you'll never get her out of this place. Thank God that He's bigger than all of that, eh? Absolutely. As a result of that, I got born again. As a result of that, we got changed. God wants to change people. Circumstances, my dad was an alcoholic and a lot of other things that caused me to be like I was. But I had to change. Have to change. Have to change.